For 400 years, the Mayflower narrative has favored the glory of the pilgrims and marginalized the Wampanoag truth. My ancestors were not brutish or savage. They understood the interplanetary significance of the sun and moon to Mother Earth in establishing a cycle of seasons for growing, harvesting, hunting, and preparation. They were people who managed their presence on Earth to be in balance with nature. We knew as soon as we were started to consider the notion of the importance of Mayflower that if it was going to, our event was going to have integrity and authenticity, then it had to speak of the whole uh, range of historic narrative that's associated with that story. We're not going to try and tell the Native American story, the Wampanoag story, because it's not our story to tell. We don't have people in our company from that background, but we have experiences that are similar and can connect to it in a 2020, 2021, uh, and want to bring that conversation to this city. When uh, people make a, a a voyage like this or a decision like this to go off and explore you know there's so many problematic things about how history is remembered um, and, and what we tell in history. For the settlers on the Mayflower who felt they were sailing to a new world it was a, a world that had been inhabited for many thousands of years by indigenous peoples who were greatly impacted by the arrival of the Mayflower and subsequent ships that followed and we wanted to, to challenge that idea and to uncover perhaps previously overlooked stories of the Mayflower sailing, but also to remind people that we only have this world and we need to look after it. I wonder what the people on that boat, the Mayflower and the Speedwell, if they had have known the process that ensued as a result of those pivotal voyages, would they have gone? They can't blame the people today. We want people to understand and respect true history. That's important for us. Acknowledge it, know it. Welcome to the Legend and Legacy exhibition here at The Box. This is an exhibition about the journey that has come to define England's relationship with America. So we've brought together objects from museums, libraries and archives across the UK, the US, the Netherlands and objects from Native America as well. 400 years ago, the people of the Mayflower were already at sea. 102 people, men, women and children, all packed together in what was a long way from being a passenger ship. It was a cargo ship. So just imagine all of those different age groups together and they're people of different backgrounds, different birthplaces and quite possibly different beliefs as well. Behind me is a new wampum belt, made in 2019 by over 100 Wampanoag people of different ages, different abilities, and all with a compulsion to create and to share something so important in their culture. 
Historically, wampum was used in several different forms as adornment for beautiful objects to wear in the ears and around the neck and around the perimeters of the body. Wampum was used in the form of disc beads as decorative pieces, adornment pieces, but in the form of tubular beads, that's when wampum really reached a very unique form of being able to signal understandings. For hundreds of years, wampum has been central to Wampanoag culture. And the shells, in fact, that the beads are made from are indigenous to the Wampanoag nation itself. So we're so pleased to be able to show it here. And it's here in England now as a result of an extraordinary partnership. 400 years ago, England took its culture to America. 400 years on, the Wampanoag people are bringing their culture to us here in England. We're here in the Pilgrim's Gallery at Bassethorne Museum and behind me we have a map of the Greater Retford area which saw the rise of the Mayflower Pilgrims and was a real hotbed of religious nonconformity in the 17th century. It spreads from here in Retford to South Yorkshire and also over into Lincolnshire as well. And uh, in this area, we saw the rise of a lot of really key pilgrim people. So William Bradford, William Brewster, and um, John Robinson and John Smith as well, who really influenced these nonconformist separatists to go on and become pilgrims. Brewster is a really key figure. We have our reimagined space that would have been perhaps in Scrooby Manor, so that's our Brewster study. And we have an excellent local actor portraying him in a mirror where he appears and tells four stories from his life. So the interactives are really based on his point of view as a, a pilgrim elder. Christopher Jones, very important man for Harwich. Uh, he was born here. He was born in this house where we're standing now. The house itself was built round about 1550, although we don't know, we've not been able to find the plans of it, but we do know that it was built here round about 1550 and that Christopher Jones was born here and he lived here. It's always had a little plaque outside saying it was Christopher Jones' house, captain of the Mayflower. The house was restored by uh, the owner, Mr Stephen Dixon, who used to live here. Uh, he now lives in the property behind and uh, he's, he over many years, painstakingly, he peeled away the layers uh, in, in the up, particularly in the upstairs uh, rooms. He, he, did, he did really a very good job and uh, with Mayflower 400 being in the offing, uh, Tendring District Council, uh, who've been so supportive of Mayflower 400, uh, they made him an, an, an offer that uh, uh, he would, they would rent the house uh, for the time being. Hopefully, uh, for the future, perhaps uh, we'll be able to retain it as a, if you like, as a living museum and, and as, a, as, as a reminder of Christopher Jones and his importance in, in the Mayflower story. We are somewhat of detectives as we see how they did things in 57 and the types of materials they used and certainly in Brixham at the Upham Shipyard, they used the finest materials available at that time. For them, it was probably very, very hard to be able to build a wooden ship like this. And to see what came out of that Brixham at that time and last 60 years with just regular and routine maintenance is fantastic. It gives me goosebumps, you know, it's just like, it's gathering of people, the gathering of traditions, the gathering of you know, people from all over, different uh, parts of the world. I think I would say tradition. I think it embodies a lot of different traditions, from traditions within America to traditions between Great Britain and the United States to traditional shipbuilding. So. I think it's now become an American treasure. And I think the Americans have demonstrated they'll do anything to protect and preserve it and help people look at the history of Britain and America. So if you could sum up in a word or two what she symbolises. Hope. Right now, hope. <laughs> yep. Hope. Hope when she came and, and even still today.
Speedwell is about the idea, it's exploring the idea of no new worlds. So for the settlers on the Mayflower who felt they were sailing to a new world, it was a, a world that had been inhabited for many thousands of years by indigenous peoples who were greatly impacted by the arrival of the Mayflower and subsequent ships that followed. And we wanted to, to challenge that idea and to uncover perhaps previously overlooked stories of the Mayflower sailing, but also to remind people that we only have this world and we need to look after it. In the eyes of the European, the expectation is that we arrive with buckskins and feathers. The expectation is that we are somehow outside of our present time. And I thought it would be important to make, make a settlement in the UK bringing hyper-contemporary, very present indigenous people from so many different nations to develop this idea of complexity so that we're not one dimensional, so that we can celebrate our arts and our sciences and not be reduced to, you know, a brave or warrior in the context of the beauty that is our vast and varied cultures. That was a big part of, of what I thought settlement could potentially be, was, a, was an opportunity and an exchange of intersectionality rather than a voyeuristic experience of look at the Indians. And so by participating in this, this act of colonization, we're actually following their models, but we're embedding our um, indigenous cosmologies within that, but also within a 20th, you know, 21st century uh, um, context, which is something that I think indigenous people have this is, these are one of the tools that have um, relocated us to the past. of the Heart brings together musicians from every corner of Southampton and every corner of the globe. For centuries and centuries people have been coming to Southampton and leaving Southampton in search of a new life. So the sailing of that ship was one of thousands of ships which left Southampton and we really wanted to mark all those journeys and all those people who'd been impacted by those journeys. So it was a real opportunity to look at all the different communities of Southampton who have come here seeking migration or refuge or are asylum seekers and really celebrate the fantastic city. From opera to reggae, chora to harp, the patchwork of performers unite to tell some challenging, sometimes harrowing stories of migration. We were living under shadows of death and fear. It's a, a community theatre company. We work with all ages. The area's got local relevance to the Mayflower history. The master of the ships, Christopher Jones, was born in Rotherhithe, and quite a lot of the crew came from Rotherhithe. 
probably late 2017, somebody in Southwark mentioned it was going to be the 400th anniversary. And I knew little about the Mayflower. And my response was, I don't think many people know this story at all. And they're asking for community participation. So maybe we should just find out about it. The Bubble has a history of exploring subjects and making pieces of theatre. We call it vernacular theatre. So I suggested a process of research, community research, creative workshops, and then working material up into forms of sharing. I can't quite remember how long I've been involved, but I got involved um, in the measuring. So there was an event um, in the park near the Bubble Theatre, and I was looking for something community-based to do. And I suppose my interest was piqued because I didn't even know the Mayflower had gone from Rubber Hive. Um, and I had lived in America for about six years. So I had been to a couple of Thanksgivings and sort of anti-Thanksgivings type things. And um, I would never really considered the passengers. I hope that people that have been involved in the project like directly take away um, a sense of play and exploration and curiosity, that expanded sense of self that comes from seeing bits of yourself in someone else, whether that's someone that lived 400 years ago, someone that has tried to cross um, the Mediterranean Sea, or somebody that's sitting across from you in the room. I hope the legacy has been just creating a space for people to really talk about and be truthful and brave in looking at, um, looking at the past and today. I hope in, in, uh, in 50 years' time um, we won't have to make that much of a fuss about it. I hope it is something that will be known of and the, 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 the various strands of it will be known far better than they are at the moment. Um, and I hope it will be a, a, a possibility to just reinforce and to reconnect. The idea came to create um, an outfit and I wanted to be historically accurate to the period of time that the separatists left the Midlands and I uh, sought the help of the Stitching Group which is a group of volunteers and they're based at Gainsborough Old Hall in Lincolnshire and the ladies they, they recreate um, costumes from the medieval and Tudor period and they're very true to the methods that they use but they needed somebody to uh, to be a mannequin and they said you know well it's your project why not you be the model and that was the first time that it was kind of suggested that it was me that was going to become the pilgrim woman as the dress fittings went on it, i was slowly transformed into the pilgrim woman and we took all of that down to the foundry and uh, they have this amazing photogrammetry rig. It's a, this huge um, amount of cameras all on these big arms so that you've got a 360 uh, surround of cameras all pointing into the center. And I was dressed in the Pilgrim Woman outfit, held a pose and all of these 160 cameras all flashed all at the same time and recorded that snapshot of, of time which was me as the pilgrim woman so from there that image was then used to create a digital file and at that time then a few different places um, expressed an interest in having a sculpture to represent the women's story one of those was Gainsborough and the other one was Doncaster and so for the Doncaster version, we use the woven panels from the 50 Women Project, and that's um, an above life size version. She's due to be installed at the end of this year. And then the second version um, has a plain dress and is sitting by the waterfront. And just this week, we've installed her, uh, and she's looking fantastic. And she's sitting on a, a piece of beautiful um, local stone. A piece of Ancaster weatherbed and carved onto the surface is steering our future informed by the past. We got a new direction, a big surprise. Super.
right back and watch us improvise. We are theatre company Lenave Bet. Uh, where we are based in Exeter in Devon and we've worked all over across the region, the southwest and further afield up and down the country over about 15 years. And our work specialises in clowning, physical comedy, uh, stupidity at its heart and really engaging entertaining material for audiences of all ages to enjoy. Time check, five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. The question about migration, humanity and freedom has been a really interesting topic for us to touch on and even more so in the political climate of the last five or six years or so within the UK and the wider world really. And having that message I think is more relevant now than, than perhaps ever before and it's not something we would have ever perhaps touched on beforehand but we feel now is the right time to get this message involved in our style of physical comedy where you can have silliness and play and ridiculous things happening on stage and at the same time underlie it with a very serious and very important message that we believe and it's been a real great joy to actually put this show together and we hope that people enjoy it. I'm Robert Taub, Director of Music for the Arts Institute at the University of Plymouth. For Mayflower 400 commemorations, I decided to build a new music drama that asks the central question, what can we learn from the events of 1620? What can we learn from their adventures that affects us today? What I've done is to take a number of critical events that sort of quotes from the deciders of destiny from 1620 to the present and made these quotes into a kind of opera. Each scene is motivated by one of these famous quotes. There are a couple of performances that I remember um, in my life that were very moving performances, whether these were concert performances or theatrical performances or even you know, films that I've seen that really make you think and remember and affect you emotionally and really move you in certain ways. I'm hoping that the performances of Some Call at Home have that effect. And I hope that we actually take thinking about our home in a serious way. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, King, defender of the faith. The story that we wanted to tell was to take people, you know, from the roots of the story in, in kind of Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, the kind of Gainsborough, of, of actually what people were feeling at the time and why they started to to kind of make plans for a different life for themselves. And we do start at that point, pre-1620 really, at the, at the turn of the 17th century, we begin um, to start telling a little bit of the background. Um, and then from there, we kind of follow a little bit of emotionally what people were going through as they were on the ship. You are sitting on a boat. The boat is small and cramped. It pitches and yaws in heavy seas. You don't know how long is left on the journey or if you will even make it. By the time we get to the other end, it's really about kind of trying to, trying to fuse that 17th century world with today. So the plantation starts to kind of bleed between 1620 and this kind of idea of, of, of the camps that, that exist today, you know, the, the refugee camps and things. So we start to kind of introduce more modern images, things that people will recognize from the news, um, you know, from stories that we're still hearing. But, you know, alongside that, the voice, the poetry is still kind of telling that, that 1620 story, but we're, we're bringing in modern voices. You are standing in a camp. Where from here? I've been closely working with uh, the production of This Land and I was with them in uh, 
America and Massachusetts uh, for a visit to the uh, Wampanoag Library there. And um, I'll be honest, that was a turning point um, of an idea that I had. Uh, there was a seed of an idea of writing an album um, for the anniversary uh, and the 400th anniversary. And I, th I think when I was with them, it dawned on me how important it was to, important it was to, to tell their side of the story, you know, tell, um, I guess the story that seems to be forgotten. So um, I, uh, I came back after that visit and it was only an afternoon at that library meeting some of the Wampanoag tribe and uh, trying to convince them that this show would tell both sides of the story. And I, you know, I know that was a really hard process to go through. It's quite a challenge putting yourself through that because you, you have a responsibility telling that story. Um, and I came out and, and, and then, yeah, I listened back to it finally. And I thought, actually, this, is, this, this feels like it's doing it justice. Watch out, my love, watch out Before the trees are bare Hear the woodlark singing on His sad and mournful air Watch before the dark returns With its blasts and heavy rains Watch out before the winter binds The earth to icy chains Strangers, they trouble our lands. A fire waits in their eyes. Watch out when the air is sweet and brown September's eye is creeping out to draw you in beneath its gloomy sky. There is uh, a, a moment that we're living in right now where we have to recognize that, that there are diverse groups and populations within our world that, that need to be protected. And so that, that's the other reason why we, we have been using that. And, and certainly over the past couple of months now, um, we've, we've seen a heightened awareness in um, the world to, to the needs of some of our minority populations and how they're viewed. And so we look at the work that, that we're doing now to get the history correct. And while yes, this happened 400 years ago, we've constantly seen it as vitally important to understand where we've come from, to understand why certain groups and populations continue to struggle today. And until we as a, as a, as a world can, can look back and say, yeah, this happened to the African Americans, this happened to the Native Americans, this happened to uh, you know, South Americans, um, and, and, and it, it has perpetuated itself over the past 400 years in different ways, but it's always been there. And so if we can tell our history accurately, I think that people can become a little bit more compassionate in their way of, of approaching some of these touchy subjects around race and relations. First Thanksgiving of the Pilgrims as their holiday, and it was uh, it's a complete farce because 
It had nothing to do with uh, celebrating the, the unity of uh, the Indian people and the pilgrims. And it was the beginning of all things to come. And so we have nothing to celebrate. As a first grader, when the Thanksgiving story became the focus of our, our teachings at school, I remember the teacher talking about the pilgrims coming to Plymouth and how friendly Indians taught them how to live, how to plant, how to uh, fish in the, in the area. And then she said they had this great uh, Thanksgiving feast together. And unfortunately, after that, all of the Indians died of a horrible plague. And I must have been waving my hand madly. And I told her that it's not true. They're not all gone because I am a Wampanoag. And she smiled and she just said, well, of course you are. Every Indian brother, every sympathizer will go back to their homes with a different thought about what Thanksgiving Day means to the Native American. It is a day of mourning. Frank James was a school teacher from uh, Chatham. He was a member of the Aquinnah tribe, he was a gay head native. Frank was very well spoken, very well educated. The folks of Plymouth decided to make an invitation to Frank James, an Aquinnah Wampanoag, to ask him to say some words about the 350th anniversary at that point of the, the Mayflower and uh, the Plymouth Colony. They were stuck in that belief that their little picture that they uh, drew of themselves and the Indians was, re was the reality for everybody. They said that, uh, well, we can't allow you to read that because 90% of the people would walk out. He said he wasn't going to change it. decided that we would declare it a national day of mourning uh, for Native people. It's really a very mild and passive speech by many of today's standards when you look at it. It simply reflects on that the history was not always kind to the Wampanoag people. The, uh, the Wampanoag people didn't always fare well from this meeting and that bad things had happened in the past and hopefully we can reconcile and move to better things in the future. And that's that's about the best you can say and be truthful about what actually happened. They decided to start observing the day of mourning as opposed to Thanksgiving. So he came back with the American Indian Movement, Russell Means, Dennis Banks. They ran the AIM flag up on the Mayflower. Everything was a huge, just a sea of people, you know, up by the statue of Massasoit, you know, climbing the statue. And, and I remember when they climbed the Mayflower, the masts of the Mayflower, and when good old Captain Jones took a header over the side. And, you know, it just made us aware of what it meant to be Native and what our history means and what happened to us in history and how we should be responding to that. is a story about six characters who are trying to navigate their way through the contemporary modern day conversation around colonialism and the effects of it and each of them represent a different value that they advocate for. Can you see me? When you see me, what do you see? Do you see me first or do you see my surroundings? Initially when the call out happened I was a bit like oh, this feels really complicated and potentially really messy. And I think for me, you know, Helen and I spoke at great lengths going like, what, do we be part of this? And we're going, okay, if we're gonna go into this program, we're gonna go into it to kind of bring it to a conversation to today as well. We're not going to try and tell the Native American story, the Wampanoag story, because it's not our story to tell. We don't have people in our company who from that background, but we have experiences that are similar and can connect to it in a 2020, 2021, uh, and want to bring that conversation to this city and go, you can't just keep going, oh, that happened over there. Because, <laughs> you know, we're a dispersal city as well. There are lots of people that are brought to our city and we have a responsibility uh, to have these conversations.
um, white people have a responsibility to have this conversation. When I moved to Plymouth, it was very difficult for me to feel seen and feel heard. And like I've kind of been on that journey. And so the elephant in the room kind of explored that. And, like, and that's why I love the film so much. When you speak about racism a lot of the time, people respond to you like you are crazy, like it is in your head, but it's not. And I feel like that film kind of solidified that. No, this is real, you know, and having people uh, speak to me about their own feelings about it um, also made me feel like, yeah, it's real. Why is it our responsibility to give you the answers and course of action? I hear the cries and power of justice, and the symbol of power here has fallen. But it is just one statue of the past, not the present. The legacy, I hope, is that one day people will see it or come across it and go, this is so out of date. I really hope that the city has more conversations around, you know, Drake's statue, like where there's lots of conversations, you know, Sir John Hawkins Square has been put down, like, removed, and there's still a tension in the city around that. And I just think that hopefully it becomes a catalyst for conversation, but that conversation has to be met with action because I think that's the action for me is what's missing in this city, is we can just sit here and keep talking about it for, year, for another 400 years, uh, or we'll wait for another commemoration about something else. Um, and I think we have to kind of go, now is the time to really kind of start making that change happen. Dear Mayflower passengers, 400 years ago, you set sail from these shores, not knowing then that this day would be marked for centuries. Nor did you know how your journey and settlement in what was for you a new world would impact on both the near and the very distant future. You could not know then that the actions you took to flee persecution and economic hardship would in part set off a chain of events that would profit many, but at a great price to countless others. Hindsight is a fantastic gift, but it does not allow us to change the past. By looking back at your story and its consequences, we hope to shape a better and more understanding future from now on. The story of the Mayflower will be told in this city, not just from the perspective of those waiting you off, but also from those witnessing you, your arrival from what is now the Massachusetts shore. Act with kindness, compassion and wisdom in your new world. And we shall work to do the same in Southampton. Today, there are as many as 5,000 Wampanoag who are part of two federally acknowledged tribes and several small bands living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are both contemporary and cultural, and many of us continue to practice our traditions in the ways of our ancestors. Today, I am grateful for this opportunity to take my people's story out of the margins and onto this international platform to be fairly consumed. To stand with Mayflower 400 as a partner in representing this story and allow all of you to decide how to feel about it. To tell you that I do not hold you accountable for the actions of your ancestors, I hold you responsible for the future.